Well, welcome back to these Constant Contact video series where we've been systematically going through scripture. And today we arrive at um, introducing Abram or Abraham in the end of chapter 11 of Genesis. It says, Meanwhile, Abram and Nahor both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Makah. Makah and her sister Iscah were daughters of Nahor's brother of Nahor's brother's Haran. But Sarah, Sarai was unable to become pregnant and had no children. One day, Terah took his son Abram, his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abram's wife, and his grandson Lot, his son Haran's child, and moved away from Ur of the Chaldeans. He was headed for the land of Canaan, but they stopped at Haran and settled there. Terah lived for 205 year, years and died while still in Haran. Now, we know Abram and Sarai will become Abraham and Sarah. But here, at the end of Genesis 11, we are introduced to the ancestor in which Jesus will ultimately be the offspring or seed in which we can become um, inheritors of the promise. As they say, looking back is always 2020, but when we simply read the introduction of Abram and Sarai, we know very little of these two characters in the story or these two people. We know that Abram is a descendant of Noah and thus a child of the promise given to Noah. But we do not know if Terah continued to follow Yahweh and acknowledge him as God or worship his statutes. We know that Abram had a brother. They both took on wives and Sarah, uh, Sarai was barren. Finally, we know that for some reason, although we do not ex know exactly why, they leave their homeland and Ur to go to the land of Canaan, but are delayed and finally find their settling in Haran. Throughout my pastoral training, um, I've used many different study Bibles and commentaries over the year, and I will also, I'll often recommend study Bibles and, and to people who have questions, and if that doesn't answer a question, to then maybe recommend a commentary. But usually I don't remember uh, what a commentary has to say about any one particular verse. Um, typically, that doesn't stand out to me. Typically, when I'm... Um, looking into Bible study, I'll go back to commentaries and maybe read the same thing over and over again, but I, I don't have that great of memory. Certainly, I don't have a photographic memory. But in the case of Genesis 11 leading into Genesis 12, I am always reminded of John Calvin's words in his commentary on Genesis. He points that the end of chapter 11 would flow better into chapter 12 when we read at the beginning of Genesis 12, the Lord had to said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family and go to the land that I will show you. I'll make you into a great nation. I'll bless you and make you famous and you will be a blessing to others. I'll bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All of the families on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram departed the Lord is destructed, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. I absolutely love what John Calvin says next. Moses had before said that Terah and Abram had departed from their country to dwell in the land of Canaan. He now explains that they had not been impelled by levity, as rash and fickle men are, um, uh, are ought to be, ought to typically do, nor had they been drawn to other regions by disgust with their own country, as morose persons frequently are, nor were fugitives on account of crime, nor were led away by any foolish hope or by any allurements, as many are hurried hither and thither by their own desires, but that Abraham had been divinely commanded to go forth and had not moved a foot as he was guided by the word God. At least he didn't move a foot until he was guided by the word of God. And then I'm reminded of Paul preaching to the Areopagopolis in Athens in Acts 17. Paul has the chance to give his defense of Christianity as, we, as was acceptable in such places to discuss religion, philosophy. So we read in verses 22 to through 29, so Paul standing before the council addressed them as follows, 
Men of Athens, I notice you are very religious in every way. For as I was walking along, I saw many shrines, and one of your altars had this inscription on it, to an unknown God. This God whom you worship without knowing is the one I'm telling you about. He is the God who made the world and everything in it. Since he is Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man-made temples, and human hands can't serve his needs, for he has no needs. For he himself gives life and breath to everything, and he satisfies every need. From one man he created all the nations throughout the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall, and he determined their boundaries. His purpose was for the nations to seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and exist. As some of your own, some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. And since this is true, we shouldn't think of God as an idol designed by craftsmen from gold, silver, or stone. I sometimes think about the choices that we make, the choices that we have in front of us, and why we are at times in, in, in both the times and the places and even the vocations that we are in. And I sometimes wonder how much my own will has determined any of my own boundaries and if I'm doing what the Lord has called me to do, and sometimes I wonder how much control I have over any of it, if I have any control at, at all, as some of the Western mind might suggest, or exactly how much free will that we have, I am then reminded of who I was before the Lord called me and set apart. Um, today is a unique day because, um, you know, Joel and his wife Hannah that are coming, that Joel has taken the position to be both our student ministry director and our buildings and grounds manager, you know, and, and he's been looking for a place to live here and, and, and how the whole story unfolded in terms of him finding us, him applying to this position that we've had for open for two years. Only then I found out that for the past two years is has been the time that God brought them back from um, Britain and he has been preparing for such a time as this. And then he was reflecting about, I can't believe how two years ago is when we left the UK. And now in two weeks, I'm going to be back out in Minnesota and we're going to start with Faith Church. And I told him, well, I, I should tell you at some point about my own experience when I got my call to ministry. Um, and I said, because God has a way of shaking things up. I remember that when I was growing up in um, Colorado, you know, first in terms of not knowing the Lord, but then becoming a Christian and then being challenged by the way that God was acting my life. And then finally, as my story goes, in 2004, you know, Myrtle Beach, I got the call to ministry. And I applied to Bethel University about two months before school even started. I wasn't accepted until two weeks before school started. And then a week before school started, I am leaving Colorado and coming up to Minnesota. And of course, that was my first experience. But I think back to the way that God works. You know, that I had been trying to do so much on my own. And, and I had been exploring, you know, different careers, different places to live. And as I said, you know, sometimes I wonder where life would have gone. And then I re am reminded that I did not step one foot without God's call in my life. To think that I had n no purpose and no reason to even be called by God in the first place, and yet for God to call and set me apart and put my feet upon solid land, and then to think about the um, plentiful land, that milk land flowing with milk and honey, of all the interactions that I've had with since, of all the um, people that I've been able to speak through, that God has speak through me too, and I'm just blown away by how God defines the very places that we live. He, d he developed us even before we were being formed in the womb. He knew us. He knows our gifting. He knows our calling. He knows what vocation we're going to be the most successful in. He has gifted us with the gifts of the Holy Spirit that we'll explore in this next sermon series. Man, God is sovereign, and more importantly, His will is perfect for our lives. That why we would contemplate trying to grab hold 
of a of a different plan of something that isn't God's plan and try to find our lives in it. To think of Abram and Sarai who on their own are unable to have kids. Sarai was barren that their ancestry would uh, very realistically should have stopped with Abram and Sarai and there'd be no more offspring to have, let alone ever to lead to God's plan in sending his son, Jesus Christ. This blows me away to see how God is willing to take our stories that are pretty much useless, meaningless, all those words, um, and to give them usefulness, to give us meaning, to define the places that we are called to do ministry, to define the places of our work, of our neighborhoods, of even our family dynamics. That blows me away that he would have such a plan for our lives, plans to prosper us and to give us a future with hope. I pray that there's a part of your story that you're reminded of today where you very clearly knew that God was at work. Or maybe you're in a place in your life where you're struggling, wondering what is next, what does God have for me at those four. I would just suggest to you to knock and the door will be opened unto you. To ask God, I mean very truthfully, to say, God, what would you have me do with my life? Um, because if you're willing to do that, if you're willing to explore something that you may have been unwilling to explore be, uh, before, well, if you're like me, you might go from being a math major to a pastor. If you're like Joel, you might move from Rhode Island to Minnesota. As he said, it felt like we're moving to a different country. And I said, well, Minnesota is sure unique. <laughs> But I believe this is God's plan. I believe that God is at work at, here at Faith Church. And, and this, the timing of reading this text is so incredibly important for where we're at right now. And I hope that as you listen to this today, that you would be encouraged. Um, we're looking forward to welcoming Joel and his family a week from tomorrow into the Minnesota. And then we're hoping to kind of slowly start him by the very next week. And the first youth um, group meeting will be on the 20th, in which we'll introduce Joel and his family to the youth. We hope to introduce it, him to the congregation just the Sunday before. Man, we've been waiting two years for this. And now, here we are. To see God working in our midst. What an amazing God. What an amazing gift. Pray that God blesses you this week. Go in his grace and his peace. Amen.